still, and I grew up in a family who, um, I, I, like we, we, our family uh, immigrated before I was born, and then we unimmigrated, <laughs> and we went back to Korea, and then the life that we lived in Korea was interesting, because like, um, my mom was part of like a Korean singing group, um, and they toured all over Korea, and I just thought, all Korean kids live like this, right? Like they, they go to church every night and worship the Jesus together, you know? And, um, and it turned out that's not the case. Um, not everyone does that. And so I, I grew up around worship, and then later on when I got to high school, I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this thing for myself now. And um, it, worship became like the space where I'm like, it became my most fluent spiritual language, if that makes sense. Like, it, it's like the place where I feel like it's almost like effortless for me to connect with God. Um, like, you know, no offense to reading Bible and praying, that's all important, but just something about the way God wired me, um, whenever I, I engage in the space of worship, just, it just felt like I get God and God gets me. Like, He hears me and I hear Him. And it's like the space of like, there's like in the night I grew up in the 90s, right? So there's there used to be this song called In the Secret, In the Hiding Place. Like I felt God, like I felt God like in the secret, in the hiding place. Um, and it was like this intimate space and of of just me and God. So I really am so excited to talk about this topic of worship. And we're talking about worship in the lens of like spiritual discipline. So um, just to ca- catch everyone, every one of y'all up. We, we talked about spiritual disciplines in the beginning of summer, and the idea was that when summer hits, we, most of us, we switch rhythms, like in, in our day-to-day schedules, like, like Miles talked about. And so we talked about the discipline of reading scripture, so that's one of the reasons why we did the summer Bible study podcast, is so that during the summer that we have a rhythm of regularly listening and studying and processing God's word. And so now as we are about in the cusp of, like, I am so in denial, like I'm, denial, I'm in denial that my daughter is going into first grade, you know, and school starting tomorrow. Um, and, and, but uh, like as, as we turn toward the rhythms of the fall, it's an opportunity for us to kind of reevaluate some of our rhythms, reevaluate some of our, okay, what, how can, how can I in this next season thrive and, and end up on the other side healthy and feel like I'm like, a a thriving, flourishing human being. So we decided to focus on three specific topics about spiritual discipline so that that in order that we could establish rhythms that will be healthy and that will sustain us spiritually and help us thrive and flourish in this next season. And those are worship, joy, and rest. Um, And just to give you a little preview, next week, Kate Lee is going to talk about the discipline of joy, so I'm super stoked about that. And Camille Hernandez is going to speak on the topic of rest. So I'm so stoked, and I really kind of like, even more so than this, I'm so stoked for y'all to be a part of those talks, because it's going to be so good. And so when we started this series off, we talked about how spiritual disciplines, and we have a, a, a definition of it, spiritual disciplines are practices of our body and mind that deepen our relationship with God, ultimately shaping our inward character and the outward work of peacemaking and justice. Whenever we engage in spiritual disciples or discipline, there's an inward work that happens that molds and shapes our character more and more into the likeness of Jesus Christ. But it doesn't just stay inside. When when we truly engage in spiritual discipline, it also moves us forward. It shapes how we view the world around us. It shapes how we view our neighbors and our friends and our engagement with the world. I feel like one of the ways that, like, Western Christianity uh, it has been, it, I, I think I could say immature, is that we have lacked, maybe both. Like maybe we emphasize one more than the other. And, and, and so our desire for us as a spiritual community is to pursue spiritual disciplines in a way that shapes both our inside character and the way we engage with the world around us. So these are ways that we could potentially establish rhythms in the fall season so that we could press into these spaces. Now, like I said, I'm biased about this topic of, of, of worship, and, um, and I, I could give you so many examples and so many stories of like where, like, even like this last week, like I feel like God just really met me. I, I, I went to a funeral on Thursday, went to a wedding 
last night, went to a, like a, 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 a retreat site, like a Catholic retreat site on um, Palos Verdes yesterday morning. And so I feel like I had like this whole gamut of like, I don't know, spiritual moments. And then in those, there are unique spaces in those different moments, everything from like a wedding to a funeral where I felt like worship became the context where I really felt God in, in an intimate way. And so that, that's how it works for me. But for some of y'all, that's not the case. Like some of y'all, like worship is like, it feels like the warm-up act before like the guy comes up and starts talking, right? And, um, and even if that's you, even if that's you, let, let me, I think, I think I could convince you. I think I could, I could let's see, oh, oh, let's see. <laughs> I'm kind of cocky, like, so I'm going to just throw it out there. But like, I feel like I can convince you that there's something about the way that our bodies and our minds process music. There's something about, like, there's neurologically, like, there's like a foundational what it means to be human. And because I feel like it's not landing, we're going to watch this video by uh, Bobby McFerrin. Bobby, Bobby McFerrin, he's the guy who wrote, Don't Worry, Be Happy. And he, he speaks, uh, this is a video that happened 13 years ago at the World Science Forum. And it's, talked, it's talking about the neuroscience of music. And he's talking about specifically about how the pentatonic scale relates to the human experience. So here we go, let's watch this together. <laughs> Talking about expectations? Expectations. Watch. Ba, 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 to me about that is regardless of where I am anywhere every audience gets that but it doesn't matter you know that's just you know the pentatonic scale for some reason if you're looking for a job in neuroscience I think <laughs> anywhere he goes this is a world you know famous famous musician anywhere he goes in the world people get the pentatonic scale and my takeaway from that is that music is a part of our Imago Dei. Music is fundamentally what it means to be a human being created in the image of God. When the Bible talks about humanity being made in the image of God, the formation of our bodies include the formation of melodies, harmonies, rhythms, and beats, lyrics, 
and poetry pauses and crescendos and EDM drops. You like that's, that's, it's, part of our, it's part of our Imago Dei. They are an essential part of what it means to be human. So, so therefore, if, if that is the case, if that is the case, worship, like m- musical worship, when we consider that, and this is where my bias comes into play, what we're talking about is we're honing in on something that we, we're honing in on something that's already naturally embedded in us. We are, we're talking about fine-tuning something that's already there. Because the truth is when it comes to worship, Worship always has and always is and always will be. It will will always play a vital role in our spiritual formation. So the goal for today and with the series as we prepare for the fall is for us to think about worship as a discipline, something that we put into practice with a certain level of intentionality. So that whenever we do find ourselves in the spaces of worship, we can proactively engage ourselves in that space and allow to give it permission to shape our inward character, and shape how we look toward the world around us, how we engage the world around us, how we engage the work of peacemaking and justice. So there are so many ways to approach worship as a discipline, but I'm only going to talk about two ways, um, two ways for today, um, just for our time's sake. And then I, and if, you, if we want to nerd out on this, we could continue to talk about it because I feel like I, I love this stuff. I love this stuff. Um, the first thing is that the worship is a theological discipline. Worship is a theological discipline. It, worship informs and shapes our theology. Colossians 3.16, and we're going to read from the ESV, it says this, Let the word of Christ dwell, dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And I love this verse. It's one of my go-to verses when I, when I think about how do I define or how do I explain the nature of worship. And I love how kind of like the little kind of, it gives a little shout out to the opening chapter of the Gospel of John where it talks about the word, of, uh, the word became flesh and dwell among us, right? And it's that kind of same idea that um, Paul is alluding to here, the same very thought, that the word of God dwelling in us, being present among us, right? And it's always, like, I feel like, and, and for me, like the way I define the gospel is, is exactly that. The gospel is Jesus being present. Jesus is God with us in, in our sorrow, in our joy, in our pain, in our flourishing, in our thriving. That is the gospel, that he's present in all things. So I love that it alludes to that. But what this verse is getting at through about, specifically about the music, about music is um, when we engage in the practice of music, the word of, it allows the word of Christ to dwell richly in us. And it's in that space of the word of Christ dwelling richly in us that we, that we are informed theologically, that we receive teaching and admonishing, we learn and we correct. And there, there are so many moments in worship where like, I'm singing something and I'm like, I didn't know I needed that reminder. Anyone? Anyone, right? Anyone like ever, ever go to like a, another town, you're visiting there, and you're like, I'm just gonna go to this random restaurant. And you try this random food and you're like, okay, I know that at this town this food is good, but I didn't know I needed this. You know what I mean? Have you ever felt that at a restaurant? Worship does that. Everyone, like we can engage in worship and there might be a phrase or a word that sticks with us and it's like, I didn't know I needed that. I didn't know my soul was longing for that. Right? It teaches us, it corrects, it shapes us, it shapes our theology. Um, maybe it could be a word of encouragement, word of healing, or, uh, some, or a reminder of some aspect of like, God's character. Worship has the ability to be like this sneaky, prophetic voice. So my conviction is that worship is as much of a time of teaching the word as any other sermon themselves. There are some weeks, and to be honest, there are some weeks, I don't remember what the sermon was about. But throughout the week, I'm like, oh, we sang that song. And that bridge is stuck in my head, right? Anyone feel that? And I, and I think that is a sign that our theology is constantly being formed and shaped by worship. There's something about the combination of melody and lyric that allows words and phrases to come up to the surface by the Holy Spirit. And whenever that happens, it's probably an invitation for us to meditate and dwell on those words. Um, 
after, after I do this thing in front of y'all, like we're going to have an extended time of worship. And from that, from that time, or any other week from now, from this point on, if there's a song that is stuck in your head throughout the week, allow that to be an invitation by Jesus to be like, I want you to rest in this. I want you to dwell in this. I want you to meditate, marinate, let it soak, let it pickle your soul. Um, and I want you to devour it. I want you to process it and allow those words to permeate the rest of your body. And that brings to our next point, Colossians 3.17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And what we see in this verse is that worship doesn't just occupy our, the space of our minds in our heads. Worship permeates the rest of our bodies. With our minds, we can shape words and phrases and explain timeless ideas. And it's a creative process, but it usually takes place in the mind. But what we see in the text is that worship is an embodied experience. It happens in word and also in deed, in what we do with our actions. We can sing it. We can shout it, we can clap with it, we can lean with it, we can lift it up, we can rock with it, we can play with it. It, it embodies us. The Psalms, over and over again, there are so many texts of like imperatives, commandments of like, use your bodies, use your bodies to worship God, because worship is an embodied discipline. Um, I, think, I think that's one of the ways that I interpret what it means to worship spirit and in truth. In that, like, there's something mysterious and ethereal about worship that happens in our minds and our souls, but there's also something real and practical that's happening tangibly with our, with our hands and with our bodies and with our feelings and with our senses. Because worship is theology embodied. It is, it is the way we allow our bodies to carry what we know about God and how we feel about God. Sometimes in, it's in celebratory songs, and sometimes it's in songs of lament. Sometimes that sounds like pretty angelic voices. And sometimes it sounds like, ah, God, where are you? Um, and I think those are just as much an act of worship as any other Hillsong, Bethel, Maverick song that we could think of. It's, it's an embodied theology. I mean, can, can you imagine like how much healthier <laughs> our souls, or, or just, or maybe generally, like, can you imagine how healthier our churches would be if we had a healthy diet of like a balanced diet of like celebration songs and songs of contemplation and songs of lament? Like, how how different would our churches be? How different would our souls be if we had an ex existing practicing muscle for those spaces, right? And so that, I think that's the kind of vision and kind of invitation that we're, I'm asking you all to step into in this season as we engage in worship. What does it look like for us to embody these spaces, to, to sing songs of celebration and be and allow it to be a regular form of discipline? And sing songs of contemplation and allow that to be a regular form of discipline? And sing songs of lament and allow that to be a regular way of how we engage with God? And so this brings to um, my last point, which is that worship, worship is a discipline of culture making. It's a discipline of culture making. As the discipline of worship informs and shapes our theology, it's inevitable that worship leads to creating culture. Um, so, I've, uh, so leading up to um, today, I, I've really been inspired by the writings of Sandra Maria von Opostal. Um, she is a Latina worship leader. She's a pastor. She's an advocate. She has long time been uh, uh, at staff at InterVarsity. And she, her, she's prob she probably, um, her most kind of like thing that she's known for is for many years, she has been the music and worship director of this event called Urbana. And Urbana is like this huge mission conference that happens in, um, sorry, in the Midwest, it's all kind of the same to me, I apologize. Um, and it happens every three years. And it's like this huge mission conference. It's, it's, um, and one, one of the things that, that's, that is unique about the worship experience at Urbana is it's very intentionally 
decentralized to the Western experience. They're very intentional about how can we incorporate African songs? How can we incorporate Latin, Latin American songs? How can we incorporate East Asian songs? And also incorporate Southeast Asian songs, but it's so different. And, it's, and, it's just, and so she's been kind of like the spearhead of that for many years. And so um, in one of her books, it's actually a booklet, it's super short. Um, it's called The Mission of Worship. And she tells a story about how in her years as an intervarsity campus minister, um, her campus decided to engage, through a season, engage in um, diverse forms of worship. And out of frustration, one day, one of the students like, told her, like, when do we get to just like, sing, like, when do we just get to worship? And then, you know, and so Sandra uh, von Opestar said, like, asked, like, what do you mean by just worship? It's like, when, when do we get to just do like regular songs and normal songs? And then she begins to explain that most of us, we experience worship um, through the filter of culture that our experience of worship is always tied with our culture. And with this, like our cultural values and norms and rules get Im implicitly communicated. Just like any other language, um, you know, we speak in a language, we always speak in language in a specific cultural context, right? Any language, different language. This whole week, well, my dad is in town, so I've been speaking a lot more Korean than I usually do. And I realized it really, there's a different, the Korean language embodies values very differently from English. And how we, is, is a collective language. You don't just say, oh, like, I, I did this. It's like, oh, no, we did this. And, and so, like, I'm, I'm picking up on these little stuff. So, like, any language, it's spoken in a specific cultural context. Values, rules, and codes, and worldviews are embedded in culture. Language shapes how we view ourselves and how we view um, us to the world around us. And, and, and with that in mind, what type of culture is our worship communicating? What type of culture is our worship communicating? <laughs> I'm so reluctant to say this, but okay, since I said it, now I gotta say it. Like, what are we saying when a majority of our worship songs are written by like white males? What are we saying about church cult? Like, what what the, what the body of Christ is like? There's like haunt, like haunting memory that I I've been I haven't been able to shake off in the last four years. Um, and I was, um, Rayanne uh, got me tickets, a free ticket to see like one of my favorite worship leaders of all time. This worship leader, we sang his songs. Um, he's been so, so influential to like just me as a person and me as a worship leader. And like, I, and it was like a, and it was, it was so, so dope. It was like, it was a free concert. So like, I'm all about that, right? Free concert. And it was for like, it was a recording of, of, of a, like a new album, right? So like, and how they did that, I was like, hey, we're gonna record these new songs. And so here's a secret link. You're gonna have to learn these new songs that isn't published yet. And you're gonna come here and you're gonna sing these songs. And I was like, so stoked, so excited. And like, and like, and so like, I, I, got, there, I got there early. Um, I was like, like, I was like right in front of the stage and it's like me, middle-aged person, and like a bunch of like Biola kids, you know? And, <laughs> um, and I was so stoked. And so like the first, the first set goes on and like, it was, it was, like, it was awesome. And, and then it was like intermission. And then the producer comes out and the producer, um, he's also a well-known guy. We, we, we've also sang his songs. He, he comes out and he says like, hey, you know, isn't this awesome? Like, and he just kind of shares about the vision of the album and this is where we felt like God was leading us. And it was such like, it's, and, and it sounded like a really awesome process. And, um, and he says like, hey, and, and look at this, look at this. Like, this is what heaven is like. Look, look, and like, we have people like represented from like all over leading this, leading worship together. But I'm like, I'm looking around and I'm like, okay, I see um, a white male leading these songs. And I see a, a Latino um, sister like leading these songs. And I see an African American brother playing the drums and, um, and everyone else is white. And, and I'm like, yo, like this is an Irvine, man. You couldn't get one Asian person. <laughs> You know, <laughs> like there's literally a Korean church across the street, and and then what that communicated, what what that communicated about the culture was, Asians could watch, Asians could stay here and watch and participate 
but you, you guys aren't represented here right now. So for like, there's like this disconnect of like, we're talking about this is what the kingdom of God is like, but some of you are participants. Some of you are consumers. And some of you guys are leaders. And so what, what, what does it look like for us to be intentional about how we engage worship in this way? What, what are some ways that God is inviting us to co-create in the act of worship? Because it is an act of co-creating with God. You know, and the passage that the um, producer referred to is this, Revelation 7. After this I looked, and behold... A great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and people, languages, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, wearing white, white robes, with palm branches in their hands. This is a symbolism of reconciliation. This is a symbolization, sim, um, symbolic of like healing between nations and tribes. Uh, crying out, with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne, to the, to the Lamb. And if Revelation, if it is indeed this eschatolo eschatological vision, like this vision of the end, perhaps this might be a good place to start. You know, let's, let's Stephen Covey this. Like, let's start with the beginning. <laughs> let's, let's start with the end in mind. What does it mean for us to enter into this season, in the fall season? And as you think about the disciple, uh, discipline of worship, think about how can our worship inch a step closer to this vision? What would that look like for us? First thing, just one practical thing I want to point out. If you, if you all are non-Asian, <laughs> and have the gift of worship, we need you. We want you to be, to be represented. We need your voice. Because I think the vision of worship that the Bible lays out for us is that it is a hospitable space, that it is a space of solidarity, that we stand with one another, and it is a space of mutuality, that we need you, that we need you. And we're present with you in those spaces. What if our worship truly reflected that we are of one faith but of many cultures? What if, what if we, in our personal times of worship, what if we searched out songs that are not from our own culture and we practiced it in our lives? What would that look like? What would our worship sound like if our worship communicated that all God's people are welcome here? What would our worship look like if they proclaimed and demonstrated that the good news of God is for the poor and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor? I wonder if that experience of worship would push us into uncomfortable spaces. But in those spaces, allow us to become shaped more and more into the likeness.